Are you doing the ringy dingies or am I hanging about like a spare fish? Uh, could you ask me that question again? Are you doing ringy dingies or am I hanging about like a spare fish? Uh, you're hanging about like a speared fish. But uh, now that I'm 40 seconds into your phone call, let me give you Able Danger Protocol 27 Charlie. Are you ready? I am. Okay. One ringy dingy, two ringy dingies. What should we talk about today? And before you tell me what we're going to talk about, I honestly think we got these guys clobbered. C-L-O-B-B-E-R-E-D. Clobbered. But go ahead, David. Over to you. Well, I think you're right, but I, I, I think I've got an apology to make because I perhaps was misleading myself or you or members of the group for some time because I kept on harping about um, the uh, the conspiracy that was taking place in London, and certainly it is taking place in London, and maybe I've drawn attention away from Chicago, um, but what appears to have been happening in this current, in the disappearance or the death of Captain Chick Burlingham, your U.S. Naval Academy classmate. I think, Field, he was the high-value target for Flight 77 on 911. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does, because uh, his job in the Navy Reserves, where he served as a captain, uh, as in, that's, who gives a rat's ass? I don't. But he was an 06, which means officer, sixth rank, which means captain, and he was serving in the uh, reserve forces of the Navy. Uh, strangely enough, uh, these PFers, and I think everyone who's been around uh, Able Danger for a while, and I'm distracted because I'm trying to get into chat, but anybody who's got more than three or four shows under their belt at Able Danger knows what a PFer is. Uh, the first word is pig. The second word is offensive. And the PFers, which basically, if you wanted to reduce the PFers in the United States of America to a threesome, I would say the three biggest PFers in America are Hillary Clinton, Christine Marcy, and Zigbu uh, Brzezinski. David, do you know who is Zigbu? Is he the guy that was lugging around some Kalashnikovs when he met uh, Osama bin Laden in Kitha? Uh, I'm not certain, but he's the guy that sort of hides in the shadows. Uh, but he has been manipulating the shadow government, which has been run since 1978 by my sister, Christine Marcy, who is, in fact, a belligerent bovine of the extreme lesbian persuasion. And I have no, let's say that I am committed up to the point of my own death to prevent lesbians or any other PFers from destroying the United States of America. And I think that between Vladimir Putin, um, Agent Chips, and China, and BRICS. I think the PFers in the United States of America are DOA. Do you remember what DOA stands for, David? Yeah, dead and arrival. Yeah, go ahead. You say something smart while I get into the chat room. Okay, well, I've been thinking about this idea that uh, the pilots become the high-value target and the crew and passengers are collateral by looking at the meta conspiracy. I think I taught you what meta conspiracy was, but we won't go into that field because I know you instinctively understand it. But at this meta conspiracy conspiracy level, they look for, how shall I put it, vulnerable women of uncertain sexual persuasion. Come on in. In the early, go ahead. No, no, I, I have a guest in the studio. I don't know who it is, so I turned the camera off him. But keep going, you talk, and I'll find out who my guest is. Okay, of uncertain sexual persuasion, maybe because of their youth or whatever the circumstances are, entrap them at an early age, probably in a child brothel or something like that, same sex, and then blackmail them for the rest of their careers. And of course, when we're young, for a variety of reasons, we can fall into traps like that. And uh, once we're in, I guess it's exceedingly difficult to get out. Anyway. Keep going, David. I'm talking to a guy who's he's going to kick the ass of these people. Uh, but don't let our background noise disturb you because the guy I'm talking to might be able to flambe uh, Plum City during the weekend where I have to be involved in Operation Tel Aviv Cod. Now, David, do you know what Tel Aviv Cod stands for? No. Good. 
If you don't know what Tel Aviv Cod stands for, Tel Aviv, of course, is Israel. Uh, Cod, everyone at Able Danger that has any position of prominence already has gotten a message about what Tel Aviv Cod stands for. Um, and I don't know who's in the chat room, but if Bucky Badger or Gloria, uh, oh, I almost slipped and said her last name, Presley. I don't want to expose any sources. So when I, said, when I almost slipped and said Gloria Presley, obviously I meant Agent Glow. But Operation Tel Aviv Cod is scheduled for the 16th to the 18th of September in Israel. Are you aware of that, David? Yes or no? Yes. Okay. Well, I'm not making this. In fact, wait a minute. Where's the camera? The camera's not going to you. Don't worry. Um, I had a, a gentleman who I know. I met him last July. Let me tell you truthfully, and Bucky or Pat, or Glow, or anybody else that was, well, Agent Bean or Craig Peterson, I don't know who's in the chat room because I'm not there yet. But anybody who was in Jack Max RV last July, let me, I'm really crunching my head. I think it was July 19th, I think it was Saturday night. But anyway, uh, yeah, a guy, well, wait a minute, I'll show you what the guy looks like, but this guy's, he's not the real guy. This is a doppelganger, he's a double. He looks like that, but that's not him. But uh, a guy that looks just like the doppelganger came into the RV with a sense of urgency, and he said to Bucky, Jack, Mac, Patricia, Gloria, and a couple of my family members, he lowered his voice, and he said in a threatening way, any of you people know where Field McConnell is? And uh, <laughs> it was really funny because I'd met him at Sandy's gas station about 10 minutes prior, and he gave me a picture which is in this room. Let me, David, hang in there. I mean, what we're doing, David, is we're kicking the ass of Obama, Hillary Clinton, Christine Marcy, and if I were not a gentleman, I would say the pig fuckers, but uh, I am a gentleman, so I can't say pig fuckers, but I can show you this picture. David, you don't see the picture, but uh, suffice it to say, that this picture, uh, which is a uh, Reynolds Tavern, Annapolis, Maryland, 1737, a significant structure in an important governmental center, at this date, style is more ambition, ambitious than consistent, with awkward height, shed roof dormers, all header brick bond, and idiosyncratic arch string course. Now, if you think that's a mouthful, uh, guess what? I'm going to show you one more. I, I just had another guy walk in. I've got seven guys in Plum City that look alike and they dress alike. I'll just show you the second one. But when I show you the second one, you'll be wearing Craig Peterson's hat. So you'll know that it's not the first one. So here comes doppelganger number 17, which really is the second guy. That That's him. Yep, and he's saying hi to all you guys that are not pig fuckers. And just, just for the people out there that are easily offended, you know what? When you swim in the sewer with a bunch of rats, you better not be wearing a tuxedo. Uh, David, over to you while I entertain my guest. Okay, thanks, Phil. So it appears that Kate Warren, who was the theoretically a spy for the Union uh, Army, in uh, the Civil War is a role model for your sister, Christine Marcy. Keep going. I'm, I'm talking, uh, David. I'm, I'm listening while I'm talking. Okay. Now, Kate Warren was recruited, presumably in Chicago, by Alan Pinkerton, a Scot, in 1856. And she proved to be, according to his words, the most... Uh, capable detective in his organization, certainly the female. She was the first female detective. And uh, she was a cross-dresser. Why would I hold that against her? I don't think I would. Depends on what purpose she was cross-dressing. What Alan Pinkerton used her for was to cross-dress and penetrate, pun intended, the... David, David, apartments. wait a minute. David, just to show I'm listening, even though I've got 17 doppelgangers, three dogs, and a human named Bart in the studio with me. Uh, did you just say penetrate? I did. When 1977, I was driving a 66 Rambler 550 
from Beeville, Texas to Fargo, and I was going about 55 miles an hour flat out when two semis crawled up on my back bumper. And guess what one of the semis' call signs was? Penetrated. Uh, good buddy, you got the golden penetrator, and I'm sitting behind a four-wheeler that's going 55, and if he doesn't move his ass, I'm going to drive over him. To which I said, listen up, you big bullshitter. If you try to drive over my ass, I'm going to blow your engine with an electronic device. At which point, the golden penetrator said, uh, back off there, rubber ducky. We got a real player. Go ahead, David. <laughs> Did, did yeah, that make any sense? When I was did driving a 17 ton truck across the Australian desert and I crept up behind very cruel, very stupid, a little old lady driving in the desert and I let loose a blast of the air horn and I frightened the hell out of her. But that was young and mean, but I'm hopefully I'm a sweeter disposition now. Which anyway, reminds me, David, let, David, let me ask you a question that you cannot anticipate. Go ahead. Do you have any health issues? Always. Well, that's okay. Uh, guess what? I don't. And you know what? Do you know where I'm going to be on the 16th of the 18th of September? No. Tel Aviv, Israel. Do you know where I'm going to be July 31st to August 2nd? No. Tring. T-R-I-N-G. United Kingdom. But do you know where I'm going to be between Tring and T-R-I-N-G, United Kingdom, and Tel Aviv. No. I believe I'll be in Russia. Do you have any idea what I would possibly be doing in Russia? Chatting up Putin. Yep, that's right. You're absolutely right, David. Uh, I communicated. In fact, I do have a guest. And however, my guest in the studio is a female who's 19, but cleverly knowing that I have a penchant for 19-year-old females, she disguised herself like this, but uh, uh, I want you to take over and talk for about three minutes while I brief my 19-year-old uh, friend on what's going on, okay? Over to you, David. Okay, so first paragraph of today's post. Sheraton Hotels allegedly began supplying a remote, in brackets, online assassination betting service for Clinton fellow travelers after the sale to Starwood in 1998 by ITT, whose agents had developed ad hoc waypoint services to land or crash hijacked aircraft at spot fixed times. Now, uh, what is a spot fixed time? Well, it's fairly obvious. In advance of the crime, the collaborators and conspirators decide at what moment or even what they want the incident to occur that kills the high-value target and then set up a book, I think they call it a playbook, for punters to bet on the spread within which the spot will be fixed. David, are you talking uh, about spot fixing? Yes. You've made me very nervous, so I got my Eric Holder wig on. Do you know what that means? Boom shakalaka, boom shakalaka. Hey, wait a minute. We have a cheering section. Wait a minute, David. Let me ask the question again. So my 19-year-old female, uh, can, uh, she cleverly, her father, who is a friend of mine, he drives a Oliver 770 tractor, and the father said, if you're going down to Field Studio, make sure you make yourself look like a 58-year-old musician with a ponytail. So anyway, I'm going to set this up again, David. Please listen. Uh, Barry Swatero, uh, his attorney general used to be Eric Holder. It's now somebody named Lynch, which means I can say Lynch Obama, and you say boom shakalaka laka boom shakalaka. So what do you think of that, David? Boom shakalaka laka boom shakalaka. I think you guys have fallen into a nest of merkins. Merkins? Yes. Well, wait a minute. Let me show everyone in the chat room my purple sneakers. Because I think we have a couple of purple sneakers in the White House. Do you know what I mean by that, David? Uh, I can guess, but go ahead. Well, uh, these are, in fact, a pair of purple sneakers. And they do have a pair of soles. And at the end of our life on Earth, our souls don't die. Uh, now, in this case, these are just rubber soles. 
But in 1965, guess what the Beatles had as one of their biggest albums ever? Uh, nope. Okay, chat room, bail him out. In 1965, the Beatles had their biggest album to date, and the name of that album was Rubber Soul. And there's a lot of different uses for the name rubber. Uh, one rubber is a tie-breaking card game. Another rubber is a birth control device that was created by Australian nurses in World War II. But in this case, I would use the term, in fact, I will use the term. I'll go back and I will redoctor up today's radio show ad by adding two words, rubber match, because I believe Hillary Clinton, Christine Marcy, and Barack Obama are dead in the water. David, over to you. Well, that's interesting about rubber, because I was twiddling with a pencil, and on the end of the pencil, they have what I believe Americans call an eraser. Um, in English, we call it a rubber. And I was cleaning out my ear, for whatever reason, with the eraser on the end of a pencil, and the eraser fell off and got lodged in my ear. And I went to see a local GP, general practitioner, in Ridgefield, Connecticut, and I said, I've got a rubber stuck in my ear. And he looked totally astonished. Yeah. Hey, David, do you have any idea where I put my glasses? No, Field. Uh, somewhere underneath the merkin. Do you know what a merkin is? I taught you what a merkin was. Well, um, George Bush Jr., the young guy, not the evil guy, he thinks American is an American. But I seriously have lost my glasses, and I wonder where they went. They might be over here. No, they're not here. They could be out in my car. I'll tell you what. While I leave you here in the company of my 19-year-old uh, female accomplice, will you talk on with a lot of confidence while I go out to the car and check for my glasses? Yeah, sure. Okay, and if you get nervous, just tell Gladys that you would like to, in fact, let's practice this once, David. David, go ahead and ask Gladys, are you still there, Gladys? Are you still there, Gladys? Boom, shaka, laka, laka. Yeah, Gladys is still here. I'll be right back. I got to check for my glasses. I'll be right back. <laughs> okay, excuse hey, me. Hey, David, stop, stop coughing and do something intelligent. Right. Sheraton Hotels. Now, this was an outfit uh, which, if you were in the administration of Sheraton Hotels and you wanted to put together a global network of what the Royal Canadian Mountain Police called a virtual floating matrix to carry out assassination betting, you'd need to find a company that was familiar with all of the command and control systems of the United States military at the level of the National Command Authority, where the prime players, of course, are the President of the United States and the, chain, and the Commander in Chief. And back in the late uh, or the middle 90s, of course, that would have been the egregious Bill Clinton and his first generation American whose father was a major in the Waffen SS by the name of Dmitri Shalikashvili. The son of Dmitri Shalikashvili was John Shalikashvili and he came to Illinois, uh, the father with false papers, and set up in Illinois and was quite obviously identified and groomed as a treasonous chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff by the people who had been doing that kind of thing in Illinois and Chicago for well over a century, i.e. the Pinkerton Agency. So we have John Shalikashvili is groomed uh, to fast track to the point where in 1997, the then President of the United States, Bill Clinton, sent the then chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff to Beijing to give a presentation to the People's Liberation Army University in Beijing, where the said John Shalikashvili told the audience that I imagine was riveted 
Keep going. The following. Go ahead. No, no, I'm just talking to Gladys. Uh, she's trying to seduce me, but you know, I'm a man of high moral fiber and also a lot of fiber in my diet, which reminds me, I have to go to the toilet. Would you talk to Gladys while I'm in the loop? Okay, I'll continue with Shalik Kashmir. Yeah. He's in front of the audience of officers of the People's Liberation Army at the university there, and he said, my president, that's Bill Clinton, has instructed me to leave behind details of all America's weapons programs that I think in the normal course of events should have resulted when this clown comes back to the United States of America that the president, then President Bill Clinton, and then Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, John Shalikashvili, should have been put in front of a military tribunal and shot because he betrayed your country. And a great many people in the military would have known about it. And my suggestion is, Phil, that one of those people was Captain Chick Burling. The problem for the military, of course, was that when and if the mid-range officers recognized that the chairman of Joint Chiefs of Staff is a traitor and has backdoored the command and control systems, where do they go to for relief? Or in what I believe is called an equitable remedy. Well, it seems that some of these people decided with General Henry Shelton that they needed a, a counterintelligence agency in the United States run by covert military officers or ex-military officers. And I think Captain Chick Burling was one of them, and I think you were another. Now, it doesn't really matter who denies what one understands that at this level uh, there's multiple roles to play to bring this monster down. But it's very obvious you have a treasonous chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and a treasonous president in the 1996 period running through to the election which put George Bush in place. The dilemma for these people is while they're developing this method by which they hope to overthrow the government of the United States by force and develop a list of people that have to be murdered and killed during an exercise if that attempted overthrow is going to have any chance of success. You have to identify the rebels, the enemies and the whistleblowers and kill them or kill their relatives. Now one of the whistleblowers, I believe, potential whistleblowers, <coughs> was the man by the name of John Bennett Ramsey, who was a Navy pilot, as I understand, and was the chief executive officer of Access Graphics, a subsidiary of Lockheed Martin, whose directors at the time of his daughter's torture, death and snuff film production. A couple of directors were Norman Minetta, and Lynn Cheney, who seems to be a covert lesbian because she writes about some very odd encounters in the Wild West between two women in a book called Sisters, by the by. What John Bennett Ramsey and Chick Burlingham and possibly yourself would or should have known is there was a piece of technology developed by the United States Navy Research Labs called the Onion Router that protected capital ships and senior officers against eavesdropping. And that was fully functional in 1996, the year when John Bennett Ramsey was murdered in her parents' home in Boulder, Colorado. And of course was absolutely essential if the attempted overthrow of the government of the United States by force on 911 was to succeed. So your sister, with a little cabal of her girlfriends, which includes Hillary Clinton, the former patent lawyer, decided one way of commandeering that technology at the U.S. Navy Research Labs is let them to continue let them continue to use it, but file a patent application. So in 1998, they filed a patent application on behalf of the Secretary of the Navy at the time. And the patent was issued in June of 2001. 
And in June of 2001, as you know, there was an exercise. Maybe you could just, if you're still listening, could you just comment? David, have I, ever, have I ever failed to listen to any of your chicken shit in the last eight and a half years? <laughs> Possibly not, but I, I I fear sometimes you don't understand it. Phil. No, no, I understand uh, everything. In fact, David, uh, do you want to have a little uh, a little penis envy? No. Okay, I, I guess you wouldn't. Uh, first of all, I'm going to show a picture of my parents. This is my parents. Uh, the male is Glenn. The female is Eileen. They were married for 62 years, and in the 62 years, I'm only aware of one argument they had. So I grew up believing that you could be married and happy. Uh, my parents may be the only example of that I've ever seen. But let me show you another picture of my father. And let me tell you, before my father got married, when it was just a minute, I got to ask a question. Pardon? That's the troublemaker. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, this is a picture of my father's airplane, the Troublemaker, which was uh, the, the second of three airplanes. He was a co-pilot on the Wolf, which, okay, let's have a little, I feel so bad for people around the globe that don't have a clue as to what's going on. I'm going to make a whistle sound, and David, I want you to tell me if you know what the name of this whistle sound is. Ready? Good. <laughs> Wait a minute. Could you hear that, David? Sounds like a strangled parrot. No, it's a wolf whistle. And that's what young men did to young ladies back in the 30s. Okay, hang on a minute. I got a musician in the room. Her name is Latrice, and she's dressed just like Gladys. Latrice, would you whistle? Yep. You know what happens to people when they have too much vodka? Uh, no. They lose their ability to whistle, so just to prove that I've never overdone vodka or anything else. <laughs> that's called a wolf whistle. David, are you aware of that? Yes. Okay. My father was a co-pilot on a B-24D called the Wolf. Uh, they broke the nose gear. Uh, the aircraft commander got shit-canned. You heard me correctly, shit-canned. And my dad became the aircraft commander of this one, Troublemaker. Okay, here we go with some real history that Barack Obama, uh, Hillary Clinton, and Christy Marcy aren't going to like. When I got my rear end shit can from the North Dakota Air National Guard in 1983, the, I was going to say an unpleasant or a disrespectful word that starts with P. And a lot of you who know me know exactly what I'm talking about. But the, the individuals, two, plural, the squadron commander, and this is true history, I just love, I love the truth. The squadron commander and the group commander of the North Dakota Air National Guard both kicked me out of the Air National Guard on the same day in 1983. Are you aware of that, David? Uh, I think so. Yeah. And I told both of these PFers to stick it up their ass I said, I'm going nowhere, but if I go out the main gate of the North Dakota Air National Guard, every swinging dick that's a full-time person in the chain of command, with the exception of Wally Haig, is going with me. Now, for the ladies in the audience, I want to apologize for being direct, but that's a verbatim quote. And for Sherry, Pat, Gloria, uh, Maranatha, uh, Denise in the UK, Denise in Michigan, Denise in Wisconsin. If any of you want to see proof of what I've just said, that when I told the Air National Guard that if they tried to get rid of me, I would get rid of all of them except Wally Haig, that proof is evident in Canton, Texas, where underneath the aircraft that I flew, uh, it's aircraft 640965. It is the central, in fact, I'm not in the chat room yet, and we've been on the air for 44 minutes. Uh, would somebody put up a picture of Field McConnell's jet? Because I never had a jet, but the internet thinks I have a jet, and they think it's aircraft 640965. Um, and that particular jet, underneath it, there are numerous bricks, memorial bricks, 
And uh, I'll just mention three, four, four of the memorial bricks. Glenn McConnell, that's my father, Colonel USAF, retired. Who gives a rat's ass? What's his position in history? Doesn't matter. Eileen McConnell, uh, second lieutenant, US Army nurse. Who gives a rat's ass? What's her position in history? Doesn't matter. Wally Haig, Major General, retired. The only guy in the chain of command at the North Dakota Air National Guard that I respected and could fly, bar none. Uh, and the fourth name, there's about 12 bricks. But the, only, the fourth one is John Barsgard. And it's going to be hard for me to say this. But uh, two or three Januaries ago, in fact, it would have been January of 13, the reason I bought John Barsgaard a brick is because as a professional American citizen patriot, he became so despondent that he ended his own life. And you know what? If your name is Christine Marcy, Barack Obama, Hillary Clinton, Janet Reno, Jamie Gorelick, John McCain, or Lindsey Graham, not only am I coming for your ass, but your ass is grass. David, over to you. Yeah, thanks, Bill. I do believe you can bring that about. So back to Pinkerton in Chicago. They, or Alan Pinkerton, the Scot, recruited Kate Warren in 1856 and Kate Warren was responsible for developing the script for an attempted assassination of Abraham Lincoln in 1861 and justify Lincoln hiding in one of the back carriages of a train that bypassed Baltimore so he wasn't vulnerable to the assassination. But it appears feel that that script was entirely in the imagination of Kate Warren. Okay, and Kate Just Warren was a transvestite who allowed Abraham Lincoln into Washington, D.C. I'm going to share one of my Cavendish and Harvey fruit mixed fruit drops with my friend uh, Gwendolyn, who is the third of the 17 females that are with the, me in the audience, because Gwendolyn has never had a Cavendish and Harvey mixed fruit drop from England, and uh, you know what, David, would you be offended if I would join Gwendolyn in having a Cavendish and Harvey mixed fruit drop? Not in the least, Phil. Okay, and then you can get back to talking about Jennifer Warren. Uh, Jennifer Warren, Kate. Have, go ahead, correct me. Kate Warren. Yeah, I know, but do you know why I said Jennifer Warren? Because that's the name of my pussy. I'm sorry, my cat. Yeah, well, that's okay. We understand that you English people are perverts. Uh, no, Jennifer Warren... Uh, had a song that she uh, borrowed from Leonard Cohen called First We Take Manhattan and Then We Take Berlin. But before she did that Leonard Cohen hit, she had a song called, and I'm not, I'm not a musician, and Gwendolyn might sing backup vocals if she knows the song. But uh, about 1973, Jennifer Warren's W-A-R-N-E-S had a song, The Right Time of the Night, and it started out with this bridge. Sun goes up on a cloudy day. Na 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 na. In the month of May, you and me, baby, we could think of something to do. It's the right time of the night. Anyway, David, enough singing. Over to you. <laughs> okay, second paragraph. In 1998, Clinton's fellow travelers allegedly tasked Field McConnell's sister, Christine Marcy then Chief Operating Officer of the Small Business Administration with networking SBA a protege companies, SBA stands for the Small Business Administration, networking SBA 8A protege companies across the U.S. Navy's onion router and synchronizing a collective attempt at overthrowing the United States government with the circo atomic clock. That is, you don't overthrow the government with the clock, you synchronize the attempt to overthrow the government with the clock. Because what's necessary is that multiple crime scenes with great precision, a script, spot, shoot, snuff, spin, spoil team has to be located prior to the crime so that what is transmitted 
into the media and around the world is very carefully controlled. Because you want to create the impression on 911, because that was the final, the, the date selected, that there is a force out there led by this long bearded jerk straddling a yak in a cave in Afghanistan, that he is able to stand down the most powerful military force in the world. On the logic that you can fool some of the people all of the time, all of the people some of the time, but not all of the people all of the time. And thank God, Field, there were three people, in my opinion, party to the conspiracy on the good side. One of them is you. The other is your late United States Naval Academy classmate, Captain Chick Burlingham. And the third is the father of John Bennett Ramsey, who, if I recollect, was tasered twice, once in the area of the belly, once under the ear. Her skull was fractured right around, and she was garroted. Whether or not she was raped, I don't know. It's not relevant. But the gratuitous cruelty visited on that 67 year old was to me a symptom of extraordinarily psychopathic individuals of the type that your sister was moving through the United States Justice Prisoner and Alien Transportation System, which she launched in 1994 that ran under the name Con Air as per the film. So your sister had access to the kind of people who could produce a synchronized snuff film. And we must never forget that Thomas Parnett at the US Naval Office of War or whatever, I'm not quite sure I got the right terminology there, he said that the events of 911 was the first live broadcast mass snuff film in human history. And of course they were. There were cameras everywhere collecting footage back home to the custodian of the snuff film archives in the United Kingdom. The third paragraph of today's post, I'll just pop it in the chat room. Don't worry, David, I'm listening. Okay. Uh, boom, boom, boom. Okay, so I'll read this uh, third uh, paragraph. Pinkerton guests in Sheraton's Pentagon City, Dubai Creek, and Port Douglas hotels allegedly spot fixed, in brackets synchronized, a hit for a Clinton Foundation 8A betting pool. By crashing the pilot of AA Flight 77, Captain Charles Chick Burlingham, with his crew and passengers into the Pentagon. On September the 12th, 2001, in brackets, that's the date in the Sheraton in Port Douglas where Bill Clinton was staying. At 1737-19, in brackets, Sheraton, Dubai Creek, which is the hotel where Bin Laden used to stay when he was visiting Dubai in the Emirates. And I stayed in that hotel when I was in firefighting in the oil industry. So you've got this extraordinary set of hotels that played a very important role in setting up the Clinton remote assassination betting pool of 911. You've got the Pentagon City Hotel overlooking the crime scene at the Pentagon, where your sister's 8A companies and AMEC personnel were staying and would have been in a position in the U.S. Navy's research, the U.S. Navy Command Center, to identify the most valuable targets to be eliminated for any attempt at the overthrow of the government to be successful. And you know the name of the duty officer of the U.S. Navy Command Center, don't you feel? Keep going, David. I'm listening. I'm talking to Gwen She just removed her lower IOC. Okay. Captain Gerald DeConto was in the U.S. Navy Command Center as duty officer on the morning of 911, overseeing the commissioning of what would have provided the United States Navy 
with onion router anti-eavesdropping service. And had that been installed in commission, 911 would have never have happened. It was because it was being installed in commission that Hillary Clinton and your sister Christine Marcy. David, did you just say, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm clearing my throat because Gwendolyn and her friend Trixie just did a two-on-one deal. But did you just say, my sister Christine Marcy? Yes. I was just telling Trixie and Gwendolyn that my sister Christine Marcy is the most, most evil traitor in the United States of America. Would you like to correct me? No, you're right. I know I'm right. And my sister Christine Marcy, who was taken sideways at the University of Hawaii East-West Center by Barry Swatero, even though the world thinks his name is Barack H. Obama, Barack Obama's mother, Stanley Dunham, was a hooker that preferred black people, and but she's just a complete nobody. But Stanley M. Dunham's mother, uh, whose name escapes me, had been working at Boeing in Seattle during World War II, and she went to the East-West Center, and she went to become a bank big shot in Hawaii. And as a lesbian, she actually caused my sister to join the lesbian treasonous group that later in 1978, uh, President Jimmy Carter um, decided to expand by getting my sister, Christine Marcy, to create the United States Senior Executive Service. David, have you ever heard of the Senior Executive Service? Yes. Turn your microphone on, David, so we can hear your response, feeble as it may be. Yes, I have, Phil. Okay, and you know my sister was uh, commissioned by Jimmy Carter to create that, right? Uh, yes, I think it might have been the other way around. I think she created Jimmy Carter with the SES. It's funny you should say that because Jimmy Carter was a traitor, and he and Alexander Haig were both members of the class of 1947 at service academies. And for those people around the world that don't understand the significance of that, a service academy class starts four years before it graduates. So the class of 47 started in 43. David, can you tell me what war the United States of America was embroiled in in 1943? The Second World War. Okay. So what we have is we have Alexander Haig and Jimmy Carter being draft dodgers. And I am a pot calling it kettle black because in another unpopular war called Vietnam, I entered the Naval Academy in the class of 67. And I'm speaking from experience because I was at the Naval Academy in 1967 in November where I got my nasty letter from the Selective Service saying, Field McConnell, you have not registered for the Selective Service, so if you don't have a compelling answer, we're going to slap your white skinny ass in the United States Army. How do you plead? And I said, well, I'll tell you what, Selective Service, I joined the Navy when I was 17, but if you can get my commander at the Naval Academy, his name is Vice Admiral, and I'm having to reach one of the most impressive men I've ever served with. He was the, in fact, I'm going to go to the chat room, even though I'm not there. Never mind chat room, it came to me. One of the one of the three most impressive officers, and I've only been impressed by about five officers in my life. If anybody ever wants to know who the five are, email me, F-I-E-L-D-M-C-C at yahoo.com, or better yet, call me. In fact, if anybody wants to call me right now, it's uh, international code 001, area code 715-307-8255. If now before you dial that number, 001-715-307-8222, be advised that I am going to answer the phone and I am going to tell you the five names of the five officers and only five officers that I respect. But the one that I'm talking about right now is Vice Admiral James Calvert. He was the commander of the USS Nautilus that uh, was the first nuclear submarine to pop up through the glacial ice in Antarctica in 1960, I believe. In 1967, James Calvert 
looked at a bunch of terrified young men, me being one of the 1,402, and said, if you young men turn into leaders in the military, I am directing you never to compromise your integrity and to remember one word and one word only as you conduct your military career. David, would you want to guess what the word, this is unfair, but David, my phone's ringing. So never mind, David. Is this Agent Glow? Oh, she hung up. <laughs> okay, uh, that was that was Gloria from um, Georgia, and she hung up at the same minutes. And we all have financial constraints. Uh, David, I was asking you if you had any idea what the one word that Admiral James Calvert and with somebody in the chat room, I'm not there yet. In fact, I can prove it. Here's the camera on my screen, and you can see I've dialed up the chat room, but I haven't entered it. David, there was one word that Admiral James Calvert implored all of us 1,402 scared 17, 18, 19-year-old kids into remembering as how to conduct ourselves in a time of war with enlisted people who generally would be older than we were. In my case, as a Marine Second Lieutenant, if I'd gone to Vietnam, and thank God, G-O-D with a capital G, thank God I didn't go there. Uh, which reminds me, one of the guys running for president this year is James Webb, who wrote a book called Fields, my first name is Field. Fields of Fire. He wrote it. Well, I can't remember exactly when he wrote it, but he probably wrote it in the mid-70s, maybe the early 80s. And if anybody has some spare minutes, give me a call, and we'll see if I can remember who the five officers I respect are. Uh, and I promise not to keep you on the phone long if you're concerned about minutes. But I'm not concerned about minutes. I'm not concerned about survival. I'm not concerned about the NSA. I'm not concerned about MI6. Uh, I will stand with Greece and Russia and China and Brazil, and I will travel to Pakistan, Israel, the United Kingdom, and Russia, specifically Kazan, if there's three people that I have that are personal contacts, one being RCS, one being RTN, and another remaining unidentified that are one-off communicators with Vladimir Putin. Uh, I do not care about what people say if they say that Vladimir Putin is a friend of the central bankers. You can tell me that until the cows come home. That's what cows sound like when they're coming home. That's the lead cow and the rest of them follow. With sheep it's different. Sheep have a bell. In fact, um, there is a pastor, a Christian pastor named Rex Humbard, whose wife, do you remember Rex Humbard's wife? She had a really odd name, I can't remember. Any, okay, in chat room, I'm not there yet. Would somebody please put up what Rex Humbard's wife's name was? But in 1977, Rex Humbard and his wife were up in Elvis Presley's penthouse at the top of the uh, Las Vegas Hotel, and Rex said, Elvis, my wife, and her name was like Drusilla or something like that, uh, not Godzilla. That would be Barack Obama's beard. Um, but anyway, Rex Humbard's wife wanted Elvis Presley to be a bell sheep. And Elvis said to Rex, Rex, what is a bell sheep? And Rex said, Elvis, in the time of Jesus, the shepherds who were minding their flocks would have a bell around one sheep. And wherever that sheep went, the other sheep would follow. Well, let me tell you where I'm going. And I don't have a bell, but I got a Green Bay Packers stick it up your ass keychain with gold keys, by the way. Isn't it funny they'd be gold keys? Because I had a woman in the United Kingdom ask me how many cars I had in the last seven days. 
And I said, I don't know, and I'm not offended at the question because of the source of the question, but if it were anybody that didn't know me and you asked how many cars I had, I might be offended because what difference does it make? And whose business is it? But these are golden keys. They're gold. Here, take a look. David, do you have any idea what the significance of a gold key is? Yeah, most people don't. Let me tell you that these gold keys uh, can open a very important door. And I'm hoping that somebody, in fact, I don't know who's in the chat room, but if nobody else is willing to call me and let my Hawaii 5 ringtone, in fact, I'll tell you what, Gloria, one more chance. Gloria and Gloria only, if you call my number, I will not answer. I just want people like Sunshine um, to hear my ringtone. So if anybody other than Gloria calls me, I'm going to answer the phone, and I'm going to tell you who the five people are that I respect, one of them being James Calvert, and I think I already identified uh, Wally Hag, and of course I've identified my father, Glenn, Command uh, Glenn McConnell, I almost said commander. He wasn't a commander, he's a colonel. Of course, most people don't know the difference. So there's three out of five. And of course, uh, since I have a musician named Gwendolyn here, uh, Meatloaf had a song that wasn't three out of five, but it was two out of three. And it went a lot like this, David. I want you, I need you, but I know I'm never going to have you, but don't be sad, because two out of three ain't bad. And I'm just guessing that the name of that album would have been Bad Out of Hell. David, over to you. Yeah, so just thinking a little bit about Kate Wall. Yeah. Under the alias it is Mrs. Cherry and Mrs. Barley, MB, Warren tracked suspicious movement among the Baltimore secessionists. It was in part through her undercover work in the guise of a rich southern lady visiting Baltimore with a thick southern accent that apparently Mrs. Warren infiltrated secessionist social gatherings in the Baltimore area, places such as the classy Barnum Hotel posing as a flirting Southern Belle, and was quick to not only verify that there was the plot to assassinate Lincoln, and I think this is the most important word I've come across uh, in recent times, she developed... The David, David! How the Hang on, somebody's calling, and it's not Gloria. It's from area code... 805, so let me answer. We'll get back to her in a minute. Is this secret agent 805? Uh, any chance your initials are Golf Hotel? Okay, well then agent 805, assuming that you're Golf Hotel, uh, the five officers that I respect are James Calvert, Vice Admiral, United States Navy, um, Major General Wally Haig, North Dakota Air National Guard, Colonel Glenn A. McConnell, United States Air Force, that's my dad. My dad, now here is a man, when I bring him troubles to share, oh, he's always there, my dad. Paul Peterson, he was in the Donna Reed show. The other two names would be um, a pair of lieutenant colonels, one you would never ever find his name, it was uh, Doran, D-O-R-A-N. He was the lieutenant colonel in charge of BMGR 352 at Marine Corps El Toro in 1974 when I escaped from the C-130 uh, assignment I got because I told the lieutenant colonel in an F-4 unit to kiss my ass. Uh, the lieutenant colonel in the F-4 unit that I told to buzz off in no uncertain terms was a guy named T.R. Radich, who is a complete misfit. But let's be positive. Colonel Doran was a wonderful person, and he was visibly shaken when he found out I was leaving to go to Texas to fly for BT-25. And the, the fifth guy, uh, I'm having a hard time thinking of his name, but watch this. We have the world's best chat room. Would somebody in the chat room find the name? Never mind, it just came to me. James Kasler, J A M E S. K-A-S-L-E-R, and for those of you in the chat room, and David and Agent 805, who just hung up, uh, James Kasler wrote a book called Tempered, T-E-M-P-E-R-E-D, Tempered, -E -E Tempered Steel, S-T-E-E-L-E, -E -E, and James Kasler had been an enlisted man in World War II, a fighter pilot in Korea, 
and a fighter pilot in Vietnam who is the most highly decorated pilot of the Vietnam era. And sadly, well, actually, it's a joyful homecoming. But for those of us who respect military leaders, as opposed to the dipshits that serve Obama, who are a bunch of spineless cowards, and I'll let me, you know, rather than say spineless cowards, let me rattle off some spineless cowards that work for Obama. Uh, Cody, C O D Y, West Point 74. Abizad, C O uh, A B I Z A I D, A B I Z A I D, West Point 74. Uh, Martin Dempsey, West Point 74. David Petraeus, West Point 74. Stanley McChrystal, West Point 76. Philip Kinzinger, West Point 70. Okay, any ladies in the room that are squeamish, plug your ears. I'm going to give you a count of three. One, two, three. Brigadier General Vagina Pharisee, and the reason I say Vagina Pharisee is her name is Gina, G-I-N-A, and after she drank the Kool-Aid and took the millions of dollars to shut up, she was retired from the Army, and she was given a cush job at the Veterans Administration. And David, most people in the United States of America are well aware that we have 22 veterans a day committing suicide. We have 600,000 veterans awaiting treatment. And Robert McDonald, Vagina Pharisee, and Barack H. Obama are committing treason against our veterans. And when I go pick up the hearse in Cherokee Auto Group, in fact, for any of you doubters or newbies, uh, Google this do a web search for Cherokee Auto, A-U-T-O, group, G-R-O-U-P, dot com. When you get to the menu, scroll down to Cadillac. There should be three Cadillacs. Hit the Cadillac menu. There should be three cars that pop up. Which will, one will be a 1996 hearse. And that 1996 hearse either has been or will be at the Toma, Wisconsin, VA hospital, which is also known as Candyland, because some pervert, and what I mean by that is not a homosexual, but a perverter of justice, there's a pervert in Toba, Wisconsin, who is passing out narcotics to veterans for two reasons. Number one, to make sure they can never get a concealed carry license, and more importantly, which is higher than number one, they can never appear as an expert witness in court. David, do you think these pig fuckers are going to win, or do you think we're going to win? We will win. Yeah, you're right. We're going to win. Okay, over to you, David. Okay, so Kate Warren, in 1861, developed the phony script which persuaded Abraham Lincoln to place himself under the control of a bogus... Pinkerton security detail, and when Kate Warren and Alan Pinkerton realized they could pull that off, in 1865, they arranged for the bogus Pinkerton security detail to assassinate Abraham Lincoln. Now back then, of course, they didn't have the internet, but instead of the internet, they used the telegraph system. Back then, of course, they had railway billionaires, as they do today. They had very powerful owners of big hotels, <coughs> as they do today. Nowadays, of course, instead of the telegraph, they have the internet. But they still have the ability to arrange remote assassination betting. Now, it's interesting when you point out what your journeys might be in the future field, and you talked about the golden key. Well, we know that in Canada, the company called McDonald Detweiler and Nortel Networks developed the public key infrastructure system adopted very naively by the United States military. And, of course, what that does is allow 
the owners of the root key, as it's called, to spoof the American command system. So a mid-ranking officer, for example, the officer on the bridge of the USS Cole, would have received a instruction or authority to take his ship into Aden Harbor. Hey, David. To be yeah. Did you just say spoofed a military officer? Yes. You didn't by any chance say spoofed a professional military officer, did you? No. Good, because guess what happens to professional military officers? They tend to die. Or they tend to get out of the military early. I'll give you two examples. I think you'll recognize both names. Are you familiar with the name Lieutenant Commander Brian Garish, Royal Navy? Yes. Are you familiar with the name Lieutenant Colonel Field McConnell, North Dakota Air National Guard? Yes. Okay, both those names, regardless of who they are, they are professional military officers and they are engaged firsthand in saving Greece. Now, one of us, oh, I guess I just exposed myself. Come to think of it, I am an exposure artist. Uh, if Maranatha's here, and I apologize to the chat. Oh, wait a minute, I know Swamp's here. because She just put up a picture of my verse. Swamp, would you please put up Ephesians 5.11? Because when I say I'm an exposure artist, I am, but I'm also a cunning linguist. Because in Ephesians 5.11, it says, have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. Guess what, Obama? Guess what, Cameron? Guess what, Stephen Harper? Uh, you three, I'm, I'm trying not to say queen's pussies or limp dicks. David, can you think of a name that would not be offensive if you're trying to describe Harper, Cameron, and Obama? Uh, a triad? A triad? Yeah. I'll go you one further because I just thought of it when I asked the question. David Cameron is a pedophile abuse survivor. And apparently when you are violated as a vulnerable young person, then it seems reasonable to you to continue that. Now, David Cameron is uh, the queen's pussy in charge of the United Kingdom on paper. Um, David Cameron has covered up Prince Charles, Prince Philip, uh, J James, Jimmy Savile, Ed Heath, and Redacted. And David, if anybody irritates me in the next 10 minutes, I'm going to say who Redacted is. But I will say this before I get irritated, that David Cameron... And this is a term, if anybody is not from England or Australia or New Zealand, please plug your ears. I'm going to use a term that is polite in those three countries, but it's considered vulgar in the United States and Canada. So everybody on the count of three, plug your ears. One, two, three. Obama, Cameron, and Stephen Harper were boogered as children and uh, David Cameron, I believe, was abused by his own father. Um, Barack Obama, there is, first of all, prior to my sister, Christine Marcy, my phone's ringing, David, let's see who this is. I think I know who it might be. And I think, no, I'm not. David, you hear my new tone? Yeah. Okay, I'm, I'm gonna answer this. Bear with me, David. Is this 805? Yeah. Okay, what do you want? Because I'm still doing the live show. I think they hung up, David, so it doesn't matter who they were, although I know who it was. Um, but anyway, uh, I don't know, maybe Swamp Rat or maybe one of the intelligent people know if it's possible to survive pedophile abuse and not become a pedophile yourself. But... Um, I think you're familiar with the name Turdy, T-U-R-D-I, as it relates to Barack Obama, yes or no? Yes. Are you familiar with the name Pardo, P-A-R-D-O, as it relates to Mitt Romney, yes or no? 
Yes. Are you familiar with the word chainsaw as it relates to Stephen Harper, yes or no? Yes. Well, three out of three ain't bad, according to Meatloaf, uh, who had a song uh, on the album called Bat Out of Hell. Uh, I think the bats out of hell uh, are eating poison mosquitoes, and I think we will defeat these people, just give it enough time. Hang on a minute, i got to say goodbye to Gwendolyn, I think. Are you leaving? Yeah. Okay. Just a minute, David. Gwendolyn is leaving. Goodbye, Gwendolyn. Later, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, I'm usually here. Okay. Yeah. You got my card? I do. It's right yeah, give me a class. call or an email if you have any questions whatsoever. All right. I've got the camera off you, Gwendolyn. And please, put your bra back on. You're sort of flopping around. <laughs> You're going to drive people crazy. <laughs> so, David, just give me five potatoes, one potatoes, five potatoes. Okay, back. I'm back by myself. Uh, these people, being Harper, Cameron, and Obama, who collectively are the uh, Queen's pussies, uh, they're not fooling everybody. Uh, yes, they're fooling a lot of people, but in order to prevail, they have to fool everybody. And I would like to thank uh, Afterburner uh, over in uh, Brighton, England, who just put up a image, said this is a no limp dick zone. Um, and I haven't been in the chat room. I just, I just got in the chat room now, so we might have to extend our, excuse me, I had a wonderful lunch. Oh, Afterburner put up Brian Gerrish. Yeah, he is a good man. Um, and I want to thank Swamper Mama for putting up uh, pictures of that hearse, which has been paid for since June 8th, but I haven't picked up yet. Oh, Swamper Mama put up a picture of Abazad. Well, Swamper, I don't know if you know this, and you can't tell by looking, but he's Lebanese. Does that mean anything? Well, I don't know. You can't serve two masters, can you? David, over to you. Yeah, so I put up a picture of Barlam's Hotel, and I don't know exactly what year this uh, this was uh, sketched, but uh, the important thing about Kate Warren is she infested this hotel, flirted with potential secessionists, and developed the script for the imaginary attack or assassination of Abraham Lincoln in 1861. And by the time 80, 1865 came around, the organizers of the Civil War that were feeding munitions and intelligence to both sides, in particular sending messages, encrypted messages via the telegraph system, they had wreaked uh, sufficient carnage, I believe, to significantly reduce the strength and viability of the Republic. And I imagine that as you get closer and closer to the commander-in-chief waking up to the conspiracy, it becomes important to whack him. So I have to believe that Kate Warren and Alan Pinkerton were running agents on both sides of the fence, if that's the right word, and their objective is not to strengthen the United States of America as a republic, it's to destroy the sovereign state. Now most Americans don't know, I think, that the Pinkerton detective agencies database, back then a filing system, provided the foundation for the FBI and CIA database. Therefore, it's of material interest for Americans to ask themselves what happened or what has happened to the database put together by the Pinkerton Detective Agency, which essentially has, starting in 1850, about 165 years of data on the most dangerous crime families in the world. Well, unfortunately for the United States of America, the database, the Pinkerton database, has been transferred out of Chicago to an outfit in Sweden called Securitas. And behind Securitas are a series of banks that now have access to uh, if I understand correctly, about 32 million files on top American military and political officers, which would allow a very good chance for the next attempt to overthrow the government to succeed, because there's a Gilbert and Sullivan uh, musical or a song, maybe you can put that up or someone could put it up, Field. We have a little list. We've covered that in one of the books way back. 
You talking about the list of Adrian Messenger? Correct. Uh, do you remember what the list of Adrian Messenger was about, David? It was about identifying people to be killed. Yes, and killing them in airplanes with explosives. Do you recall that part? Yes. Okay. It was 1963. It's a wonderful movie. If there's anyone out there, which reminds me, I have to buy a book. I don't know. I don't know if Dirty Driveway is here today. Let me just check the D's. Dirty Driveway. Nope, he's not here. I think you know him as David Donaway. Um, and, of course, not to be confused with David Hawkins or David Veach, uh, who's also known as Sam the Dog. But uh, David Donaway has asked me to buy a book at Amazon. And the book is written by somebody I forgot, but it has something. Oh, it's called The Rise of Technocracy. Uh, the only problem with falling into the trap that technology and AI and Jake, Jade Helm are going to prevail is there is a form of intelligence that is much higher than artificial intelligence, and I will leave it at that. Uh, oh, somebody just answered a question. 89 people. I don't see some. I was wondering how many are in chat because I see it's quite a group. Um, and so I asked somebody if, if they had any idea how many were there. And let me give credit to where credit is due. It's Griffin E. said 89, uh, about 36 on Campfire, 89 watching live stream. Um, and Swamper Mama just put up the list of Adrian Messenger. Um, I'm asking, this is, David, please bear with me. I'm asking Swamp and Swamp only if she's ever seen the movie. Swamp, can you answer that question? Have you ever seen the movie, The List of Adrian Messenger? And we're just going to wait here. Uh, apparently the chat room is limited to 60 at a time. Hmm, I didn't know that. We can get a bigger chat room. Um, Duke, it's really a great book. Uh, I wonder what the book is. The List of Adrian Messenger is a 63 black and white crime thriller about a retired British intelligence officer, George C. Scott, investigating a series of apparently unrelated deaths. It was directed by John Huston from a screenplay by Anthony Viler based on a, 19 novel, a 1959 novel by the same title by Philip McDonald. And I don't have an answer from Swamp yet, but come to think of it, Swamp is the one who put that up. So um, I think I can go ahead with my technology, yeah, tech, technocracy rising. Thank you, Duke. I think that's written by Patrick Henningsen. Uh, and the reason I'm wasting time with this, David, it might seem like a waste of time to you, but Patrick Henningsen has been invited to go. Oh, you said Patrick Woods. Okay, well, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it's not Patrick Henningsen, Techno technocracy rising. But um, as you know, David, I'm going over to England at the end of this month. I'm offering to go to Russia and Israel and uh, Pakistan because I don't think the UK-US cabal can survive the Brazil... Russia, Iran, China, salvation of Greece, 92 now, Griffin says. Yeah, well, we, uh, we have a fair amount of people following us, which is not our goal, uh, because we don't need, I mean, it's nice to have people here, and we certainly, Patrick Wood, I thought Patrick Henningsen wrote that, and I know why I thought that. Thank you, Duke M., for putting it up. My sister was asked, what did he look like? And I said, I didn't look at his face. Clever. Um, George H., has anybody ever been denied entry to the campfire chat room? No. Otherwise, not worth field upgrading to the next level, which would double his cost. Yeah, nobody, uh, I want, that's a good question, George. No one, not one individual has ever been denied entry. There have been three or maybe it, it's four individuals that have been, they've gr been granted entry, and then because they were, uh, distracting people, they were removed, uh, and I didn't. I removed one of them, and I didn't even know I had authority to remove people until I was one day in the ch here in the chat room, and an individual who is a known disinformation. I think it's called FBI Division Five, uh, a guy that really wasn't too smart, but he thought he was smart. Uh, he started saying blasphemous things about. Jesus Christ, and whether anyone out there believes in Jesus Christ or not, doesn't matter to me, it matters to you. But 
uh, don't come into my chat room that I pay for and start saying blasphemous things um, because you won't last long, period. Now, having said that, David, I think you're aware of a guy named David Donaway? Correct. He's trying to get me to speak in front of a bunch of Pakistani Muslims. He's trying to get me to go to Israel, and he's trying to get me to go to Russia. And I will go to all three of those places uh, any time of the day. And he's cautioned me not to uh, talk about Scripture too much. But that's okay, because I think it's impossible to talk about Scripture too much. Over to you, David. Yes, thanks, Phil. So, um, I think we are closing in on the MO of these crimes that date back to the Lincoln assassination or 1861, that the Pinkerton Agency that, remember, was formed in 1850 in Chicago, based on the Scotland Yard model, which was formed by Sir Robert Peel, twice Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, in 90, 1832, which was based on the model formed by Monsieur, I think his name is uh, Frederick Eugène Vidoc, who was a criminal in and out of jail and a con man, and he launched La Sûreté Nationale. And he found a very effective way of maintaining his wealth and power over his victims was to recruit people out of the prison system. And allegedly they were reformed, but of course uh, what evidence we have for them being reformed is a little sparse. And they would be deployed to entrap the people on both sides of, let's say, a prospective civil war, so that the outcome of the civil war can be determined by the entrapment specialist. And in Chicago, of course, that has been developed and refined over a period of time, dating from 1850, where the Pinkerton Agency, irrespective of ownership, like in Securitas in Sweden, is probably the world's leading organization at entrapment. And it seems one of the most powerful ways of entrapping these people is sexual entrapment. So in 1965, with Hillary Clinton, she wasn't, whether she was married then, I don't know, and 1966 with your sister, there was a very sophisticated sexual entrapment operation functioning in Chicago since 1889 when Hull House was founded by a couple of lesbians, Jane Adams and Ellen Starr. How many D's in the word Adams? Two. Very good. Continue. And these two women set up an establishment called Hull House based on the model of Toynbee Hall set up in 1884, which was right at the heart of what would be known as the Whitechapel murders attributed to Jack the Ripper. We now know it wasn't Jack the Ripper. It was very probably Jane the Ripper using the telegraph system to synchronize the hits. So back in Chicago, you have Hull House from 1889 to the present time, well, nearly the present time, when a former marine intelligence officer managed to get it shut down. Uh, do you remember that fellow's name? Uh, well, I think he's occasionally been seen spotted in a kilt with a merkin. Uh, maybe you can elucidate. I think I taught you what elucidate was. Yes, on the 8th of August of 2007, when you were teaching me about British Invisibles, uh, Mitt, Mitt Romney's mantle pants and uh, the fact that Barry Swatero's beard was actually a male and an ugly male at that. I was given the award. Uh, this is actually a McDonald kilt and it's for waist size 36. And I, to this date, I've never worn this kilt in public. However, there is someone who asked me to bring my kilt to the United Kingdom. And there's only one person in the world that has asked me to bring my kilt to the United Kingdom. So let me just, right here live, and the person that asked me is in the chat room. Well, this would fit in my suitcase if I left out maybe three tins of Extendo Peters and 12 dozen cans of smoked oysters. So next time I go over to the United Kingdom, if three people ask me to bring my kilt, uh, one of those three... It's rather a lovely kilt. Too bad you can't see it, David. 
um, because there's an image that I anticipate someone's going to stick up in the chat room called Stick It Up Your Kilt. But uh, if I go to the United Kingdom for Operation Showerhead and Operation Tel Aviv COD, um, and by the way, when I say Operation Tel Aviv COD, oh wow, there's a bunch of junk on the floor all of a sudden. Huh. Here, what, rather than trust me, let me show you. Okay, if anybody gets dizzy, hang on. I'm going to rotate the camera. Uh, see that junk? The reason I'm showing you the junk on the floor is because most of what comes out of my mouth is truthful, and the rest of it is meant to confuse the enemy, not to confuse us. And who is the enemy? Uh, well, I'm not sure, but I think I'm going to look it up while David talks smartly. I think the enemy is identified in Hebrews 10, uh, 26 or 36. David, over to you while I do some research. Yeah, uh, okay, thanks, Phil. So, looking at the development of a virtual floating matrix in the Sheraton Hotel system, I'll just read from an article titled, Where Obama Plans to Sleep During G8. This is dated February the 20th, 2012. The Sheraton Chicago Hotels and Towers will serve as headquarters for President Barack Obama during the NATO slash G8 summit in May. The hotel, which has three presidential suites, each with a separate parlor and conference table for 12, has plenty of experience handling high-profile guests in town for heady events. The Sheraton served as headquarters to former President Bill Clinton during the 1996 Democratic Convention and during the Transatlantic Business Dialogue in 2002. And it's been the hotel of choice for the former president for events related to his Clinton Global Initiative. Now, these are euphemisms, essentially, I think, for the Clinton remote assassination betting pools, or CRAB, great name, CRAB. And the way it works is a high-value target who may be a passenger on a plane or maybe the pilot of the plane is tracked through the hotel system. Now, way back a few months ago, Field and I were discussing the UI loops out of the gate, off the runway, on the runway, into the gate. I realize now that we were... Um, probably being a little naive, I know Field, you're not naive, but perhaps I was, um, because the out, the crucial time of the out for the commencement of the spread betting clock is, of course, checking out of the hotel. And that fits perfectly with the telegraph back in the days of 1861, when Abraham Lincoln was checking out of the various hotels he stayed at on his way to the inauguration. And Pinkerton saw an opportunity, excuse me, to first of all convince Lincoln that his life was in danger and infiltrate Pentagon protection agents into his entourage who could subsequently turn from protection to assassination and be rewarded because they would be able to identify at what particular moment the man would be shot. After all, script, spot, shoot, snuff, spin, spoil, it would have been Clinton's security people who should have been guarding Abraham Lincoln when he went into the Ford Theater. They had their agents up on the stage and behind him in his box. They had their agents on the journey taken by John Wilkes Booth as he fled the hue and cry. They had their agents cutting the telegraph lines. So at the crime scene, it was impossible. And I'm talking about the assassination of John Wilkes Booth to get information out as to who was setting him up for an assassination to quiet a witness. That's exactly like 911. The communications between Dick Cheney and George Bush were jammed, and Washington went blind, deaf, and dumb. 
on 911 and communications were transferred to the conspirators using the onion router network developed by the United States Navy, supposedly to have been commissioned on the morning of 911 in the Pentagon's US Navy Command Center, but actually hijacked by various agents in the Sheraton hotels around the world, including the Pentagon City Hotel, the Dubai Creek Hotel, where Osama bin Laden checked in, and the Fort Douglas, Port Douglas Hotel in Queensland, where Bill Clinton was checked in. So the assumption is that the virtual war rooms of those three hotels were hooked up via the onion router to allow the Clinton remote assassination betting pool to bet on the precise moment when Chick Burlingham would appear to have died. Now, Phil, you told us that he didn't die at the Pentagon. Uh, he died in a drop zone. But you see, the perception that's been created, and I think that was a major strategic error on their part, was to create the impression, according to the date and time stamp on the cameras outside the parking area or the entrance area to the Pentagon, the date stamp is September 12, 2001, which is the date at the Port Douglas Hotel in Queensland, but Clinton was staying. So I imagine they, unfortunately for them, left a signature of the virtual floating matrix or remote assassination betting pool by having Clinton leave his stamp, his date stamp, on the presidential suite war room in the Port Douglas Hotel in Queensland. Meanwhile, Osama bin Laden, or his doppelgangers, were busy in the Dubai Creek Hotel, where I used to stay, in the United Arab Emirates, to frame the attack of 911 as though it originated with Osama bin Laden. Of course, the folly for Americans is that there was a full dress rehearsal on the 1st and 2nd of June 2001, presumably with Osama bin Laden in the same hotel where he's getting dialysis treatment. Outside the Pentagon, you have the Pentagon City Hotel with the cameras pointing directly on the Pentagon lawn and at the work activity or task executed by AMEC, the British company, in commissioning the United States Navy Command Center with the onion router. Because remember, What's very important for these scum is to collect the money shot because you don't get, you don't scoop the pot of the remote assassination betting pool unless you have an image that is time stamped where the target is seen to be or presumed to be alive, that is Captain Gerald de Conto inside the building. And then another frame, time stamp, where the victim, the high value target, is presumed to be dead. And those four frames that we have from outside the Pentagon, they're all date stamped September the 12th, 2001. Obviously, the date's not going to change in four frames of the camera video. But the time stamp doesn't change either. So it's very hard to see exactly what's going on. But one thing is certain. It is not a large passenger jet that moved across those four frames. Each of the frames is stamped 17, 37, 19, which is the time in the hotel, the Dubai Creek Hotel, where presumably Osama bin Laden and his 8A colleagues, courtesy of Christine Marcy, were hanging out to execute the hit at a very specific time. So I see it's 1243, Phil. What would you like to do now? Well, I'd like to see if anybody's going to put up the image of COD, because as you saw in overnight emails, I've been invited to England, Russia, Israel, and Pakistan relating to Operation Tel Aviv COD. And do you have any idea? And don't feel like you have to get this right, David. Um, I don't think that you know the answer, but you might. Do you have any idea what 
COD stands for in Operation Tel Aviv COD? Uh, cash on delivery. Take a look at the chat room. Agent 66 just put it up. Okay. Circle of danger. Yeah. Now, do you see who stars in that movie? There's uh, Field McConnell and Agent Blow. Yeah. Now, there is a Field McConnell and there is an Agent Blow. And notice, for the record, I didn't say anything about Gloria Presley from uh, Atlanta, Georgia area. I clearly said Agent Glow, so if anyone thinks they heard Gloria Presley, obviously somebody's manipulating this. Oh my gosh, I finally found it. Thank you very much, Agent 66. Um, okay, I missed the whole show. Agent 60, how could you miss the whole show? Is that field on the poster? Yeah, it is. Um, what happened there, to be honest, Griffin, is Craig Peterson, who is absolutely brilliant, in fact, I, I typically and commonly and frequently and consistently say that we have the world's most lethal chat room, and I do believe we do. In fact, I can't give credit to everybody. We simply don't have time. But let me just go through an afterburner is a woman in Brighton, England, who is incredibly fast at producing stuff. Agent 66 is a woman in uh, Portland, Oregon, who is also good at producing stuff. Alicia, uh, she and I speak a different language, and I'm going to sing to her right now. Cuando caliente el sol aquí en la playa, yo no soy marinero, soy capitán, soy capitán, by la bamba. Okay, then we have Axel noting, and he's over in one town to the north of Heidelberg, Germany. And for security purposes, I can't mention the name of the town, but it sounds a lot like Weinheim, which means home of the wine. Uh, then, of course, Kanama speaks at least three languages. Then we have Church Mouse, Cliff, and then David. Then we have David Beach, who has a dog named Sam. Me and you and a dog named Boo, traveling and living off the land. Then we have Denise C. in the U.K., uh, and I anticipate that if I'm over in the UK for operation, uh, what's the name of that operation again? Let's see. Oh, yes, Tel Aviv, uh, Tel Aviv COD, COD, Circle of Danger. Um, I'm sort of spoofing these people because I'm letting everyone in Pakistan, Israel, Russia, Germany, France, Malaysia, I'm letting them be privy to my travel arrangements, which I posted yesterday um, I'm trying to think the 31st of July is a Friday and I think I made a reservation to leave Wednesday the 29th of July from Minneapolis to go to Heathrow Terminal 4 um, the flight now departs it used to depart at 2154 now it departs at 2210 probably from gate G6 at the KMSP and it would arrive, oh, I'm guessing around 11.49 at gate 8 on Terminal 4. Uh, and if one of the Able Danger people cannot pick me up at the airport this next time, I will arrange to have a Pakistani private car pick me up. Uh, and why do I use Pakistani private cars in London Heathrow? I don't know. I'll put that out to the chat room. There is a reason, and I do it consistently. Uh, so, David, over to you. I'm going up to the chat room. Uh, I missed the whole show. Yes, Griffin really makes it too. Finally got that quick. How did you know? Uh, David, I see you put up the picture of Hillary, uh, and you put up the picture of Andrew Peacock, Kevin Rood, Alexander Haig, Bill Clinton, Shalish Cashvili, and Alicia says, me and Contas, uh, Compo. I got, no offense. Uh, I never, I never ever wish to say anything offensive to a 29-year-old uh, Spanish-speaking raven-haired lady. But um, during classified operations, I should be referred to as Campo, not Field. Otherwise, MI6 and NSA and Dutch BVD and Pakistan ISI and uh, the Farm Bureau's EIEIO might find out that Field McConnell is in fact. Uh, compo. Uh, let's see. Tring. 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 Ting. Yeah, somebody said Tring. Who said that? 
Uh, James Ken apparently likes uh, the Kenya Air Force One airplane. Uh, James Ken also apparently likes the American Gothic. Love it. Agent 66 likes the picture of Janet Napolitano standing with Stupid. She's with Stupid. I could think of some better names. Yeah, so could I. Uh, but this is a uh, user-friendly show. Yeah, okay, Agent 66 put up a, build, a picture of Terminal 2E. Uh, David, do you see that image of Terminal 2E? It's the uh, building that has failed structurally. Uh huh. You do see? Yes, you do see it. Uh, do you know who's been accused of causing that to happen? No. Boeing Aircraft Corporation. Uh, oh, anyway, what is field? What does MSN stand for? Uh, MSN. It depends. The direct answer to your question, Agent 66. MSN stands for manufacturer's serial number and uh, last week on Wednesday which I think was the well today's yeah Wednesday was the first of July CEO of Emirates Airlines uh, Tim Clark was at uh, Everett Washington he went into stall 209 and he looked at MSN 1741 manufacturer serial number 1741 which the registration number I think and I have to check I think the registration number is Quebec Echo 541, but he went, oh, I see that James can put up the flying peni. Um, but anyway, uh, CEO Tim Clark apparently has come around to understanding that the Boeing uninterruptible autopilot is exactly what Boeing says it was, and that is that it's been deployed uh, since March third of 2007 and that by 2010 it would be in every airliner in the world and it is now having said that there's three airlines I'm shaking my hot sauce shake 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 shake, shake your hot sauce shake your booty David do you know what the ME3 airlines are? ME3 Middle East Airlines? Yeah, very good. I didn't think you'd get that. Uh, kudos to you. And you can throw your dog Silas a bone. Uh, he's being very quiet today, and many in the chat room suspect that you've euthanized him, but I know that you wouldn't do that. But uh, yeah, the ME3 or the Middle East Big Three Airlines, uh, QATAR, Qatar, uh, Etihad, uh, which is in Abu Dhabi, and those three airlines are three of the five airlines that are aware of the BUAP and they have uh, disabled it. Now there's sort of a mouthful. Anybody want to quote me on that in writing? In fact, let's challenge he. Oh, James can put up the song he. He can turn the tide and make the mm -hmm. He alone decides who writes the symphonies. He can take the, anyway, he is a great song uh, and originally a black man with a bad attitude sang it, and then the next people that sang it were the Lennon sisters in 1956, and the one of the greatest, most popular versions of the song, He, was by the Righteous Brothers, which involved Bill Medley and Bobby Hatfield. Of course, everyone knows Bobby Hatfield was from Beaver Dam, Wisconsin, and Bill Medley was from Los Angeles, California, and it's time, battery life at 16%, so we got to shut down for Doug M's battery life, uh, he can calm the angry sea. He alone decides who writes the symphonies. Uh, I'm going to close the song. I'm going to close the show with that after David goes away. And after, uh, what's his name, George Holdsworth gives me the trivia question. There's Tim Clark. Um, and I'm talking directly now to AB, Agent uh, Afterburner in Brighton. And I've been in Brighton. <laughs> Ginger Cookie, get your mind out of the gutter. Um, I've been at Brighton lots, and I like Brighton. In fact, I was there a couple months ago. Um, but Afterburner, who just put something up really quickly, which is a picture of CEO. Uh, Afterburner, I see the big red button from Swamp, so we got to talk fast now, David. Do you have anything you want to add before I have to push it? No, that's good, Phil. Okay, and I'm not going to push it, but I'm going to kick you off. After I kick you off, George... H is going to come in. Hey, James Ken, thank you for put.
Okay, for those of you in the chat room, and I see the camera is still on, I, I get confused sometimes by all this garbage. Uh, uh oh, I gotta go now. Thanks, everyone. Ah, uh, here comes the music, Meister. One ringy dingy, two ringy dingies. This is the music czar. Yes, music czar. This is the king of nothing. Do you remember who sang the king of nothing? Uh, let's see. King Crimson? You're close. Uh, Seals and Crofts. They also had this song. Blowing through the jasmine in my mind. I forgot what that was. Sweet. Anyway, go ahead and go ahead and try to stump me. I've never been stumped. You know, on four out of four attempts, I have not been stumped. At least I don't think I have. Over to you, George. Yes. Well, this song is from 1984. Is that within your field? Oh, yeah. I love uh, 1980. Christine Marcy and uh, Eric Holder created the DOJ Asset Forfeiture Fund. And I noticed that James Kinn has just put up a picture of the aircraft carrier in Brazil that was when it was a French aircraft. Oh, it's called the Sao Paulo. And if people wonder how I know it's folk and how I know it's Sao Paulo, well, they might as well just have to try and wonder. So Dave, I mean, George, excuse me for calling you David. No offense to either party. Um, go ahead and try to stump me. I've never been stumped yet. Okay. Uh, I, I have the entire song. So I'll, I'll read all the lyrics, and you just interrupt me if you know the uh, name of the song and the artist. Yes, Hats Off to Larry, 1961, Del Shannon. Okay. Born down in a dead man's town, the first kick I took was when I hit the ground. You end up like a dog that's been beat too much till you spend half your life just covering up. Born in the USA. I was born in the USA. I think I got it. Oh, we may have a winner. I think it's Born in the USA by what's his name? The boss? Yeah. What? Now, now I'm being ignorant, but is it Bruce Springsteen that had that? Or is it is, isn't it? Yes, it is. So did I finally get one? Yes, yes, I've trained you well with the cat food one, where what cat food was repeated three times, then that's usually a pretty good clue that that might be the title. Uh, well, I want to say that the Rothschild prosecutions, new disclosures, grace, all signs of accelerating cabal takedown, new hope for the people, is all, uh, it's, it's being revealed now, but it was actually written a long time ago that this would happen, and that's why I'm in the position I am of holding up this image of a building in Annapolis, Maryland, circa 1737. But I'm gonna stump you now, and I, get, I wanna tell you what I told my five children uh, when they were growing up. Uh, I will never ask you a question that I am not 100% certain you can answer. So are you familiar with that contract between me and you, George? Uh, I, I am now. Yes, you are now, that's an honest answer. I'm going to give you a hint. The title to this song has two letters, and the first two stanzas of the song is, He can turn the tide and calm the angry sea. He alone decides who writes the symphonies. Do you have it yet? Uh, no, it must be the pressure. No, no, you just let, you're just like David. You're putting too much thought into this. I want you to focus. It's two letters in the name of the, the title of this song has two letters, a vowel, no, a consonant followed by a vowel. <clears throat> now listen. He can turn the tide and calm the angry sea. He alone decides who writes the symphonies. Do you have it yet? JC? Yes, but go ahead and give me the other two letters. What's the title of the song? 
Uh, I don't know. Yeah, you do. He. Don't, don't, he. don't recall. Yes, you do. He. You missed the whole point. Yeah. Because, see, I told you that I'll never ask you a question that you don't know the answer to. <clears throat> and just uh, let me just sing it one more time and, and notice which, which word I focus on or spend most of my time on. He can turn the tide and calm the egg. Okay, I got it. I got it. What That's is the it? First word with title. What's what? What is it? He. Yeah. Okay. Now, next time I ask you a question, you just have to totally relax. Uh, for instance, I'm going to ask you one right now, and I guarantee you, you know the answer to this question. So don't be worried. Don't get stage fright which was a song by the uh, Nitty Gritty Dirt Band, by the way. Okay, you know the answer to this song. It's a 1961 hit by Del Shannon. I won a dancing contest uh, to it in February of 1962 at South Hadley High School. And the name of the song, I'm going to sing the song, and then I'm going to tell you all of the name except for one word, and I want you to relax and provide that word. <clears throat> Here comes the song. <clears throat> Once I had a pretty girl, her name, it doesn't matter. She ran away with another guy. Now he won't even look at her. Hats off to Larry. He made you cry. Just like you made me when you said goodbye. I... Anyway, the name of that song by Del Shannon from 61 is Hats Off to Who? Larry. Excellent. We can end the show on a high note. Okay, Mukti B. I don't know who Mukti B is. <clears throat> oh, let's just, let's both of us check the chat room so we don't. Uh, Field is cracking me up. James can. Thank you. Um, you know what? Um, actually, James, if I am cracking you up, it's somewhat intentional according to 1 Thessalonians 5 18 and 1, no, excuse me, 1 Thessalonians 4 18. In 1 Thessalonians 5.11, which says we should encourage each other. And the second reference says, just as you are, in fact, doing. Okay. Well, I'm glad we were both winners today. I was almost going to think about engaging a game theory consultant in Greece who became unemployed this morning. And uh, I get his help in creating uh, a list of lyrics that we can guess. Is he an ethnic Greek? Yeah, he was the finance minister. Oh, did he lose his job? I know that there was a little shuffle yesterday. Yeah, uh, yes, early this morning in Greek, in, in Greek, in Greece, uh, the president fired him. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Um, do you have any way to communicate with him? Uh, not that I know of. Well, watch, watch our chat room. Does anybody in this chat room? Uh, I just had an event happen that can only happen to a male that's descended. I'll leave it at that. As you notice, it didn't cause me great anguish. Um, I'm asking now Mukti B. Mukti B says he's been watching us for a year now, and he went to Valley Forge Junior Military College. Great. Maybe Mukti would like to email me. I'm 63, Asian physiotherapist. I want to help at the ranch. Hook me up. Okay, Mukti B, my email address is F-I-E-L-D-M-C-C, -C, and I'll do that alpha, alpha phonetically, Foxtrot, India, Echo, Lima, Delta, Mike, Charlie, Charlie at yahoo.com. My cell phone uh, is 715-307-8222, and there's a woman in Bangor, Maine, who's going to call my cell phone right now because she knows that if she calls it and I see her area code, I won't answer it. Um, but anyway, I think we can end this show now by playing a song, and I think I'm going <clears> to, <throat> I forgot what song I was going to play. Wasn't I going to play the song He by the Righteous Brothers? Uh, maybe you were still asking for anybody who knows the uh, finance minister's email. I can't believe Ginger was so insensitive. Do you see what Ginger just suggested I did? Yes. Isn't that hilarious? Have you ever heard of that term before? No, that's I, a new one. It's a new one, but she's a, uh, not only is she a cunning linguist, but she's also a librarian. And um, 
In fact, I think she told me this joke once uh, where a blonde goes into a librarian and said to the librarian, I'd like a cheeseburger and fries, please. And the librarian says, this is a library. And the blonde goes, oh, I'm sorry. I'd like a cheeseburger and fries. <laughs> now, isn't that funny? Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, um, Mok TV says he put up his website. I'll go there after I get home. Uh, Ginger, you are hurtful. I don't mean that really. Um, once more, your telly, please. Oh, let me put it in. In fact, watch this. Would someone else put my telephone number in just to confirm that my telephone number is what I just said it is? Because my telephone number, my personality, my time, my devotion, my compassion, my life is uh, not necessarily my own. Uh, and at 3.35 p.m. on the 4th of December of 2006, I entered into a contract. Thank you, Ginger Cookie. Ginger, would you call that number? I promise. And I see Mukti. Yeah, uh, Mukti, give me an email. I'll put my email in again. Well, never mind. I don't have to do that. Ginger, would you put my email address in for Mukti? And then when I communicate with Mukti, I will copy. Um, but copied from the entry in my yeah. help. <clears throat> That's great. See, I think it really causes confusion among the bad people when I'm so absolutely public. But the truth is, and I'm going to say this, Uh, that came from area code 357, and I'm not familiar with area code 357, but I've ruled out banger made. Okay, Mukti is how I pronounce it. Field, you are, okay, well, thank you, Mukti. Uh, I, Mukti just made a really uh, kind comment, and I don't, I don't want to correct you, and I don't want to sound uh, condescending, but the truth is, at 3.35 p.m. on the 4th of December of 2006, Monday afternoon, Highway U.S. Highway 10 in uh, the Dilworth Glendon area of Minnesota, I made an offer and the offer was accepted. So I don't do anything uh, more than I've been asked to do. I hope I don't do anything less than I've been asked to do. And I'm not afraid of what I do. Um, and it's my pleasure to be of service. And I don't know, I think you said that you were an uh, of oriental extraction, Mukti. Um, but whether someone is oriental or Eurasian or European or African, South American, Canadian, Rwandan, Australian, Malaysian, Persuasion, um, none of us pick our birthplace, none of us pick our parents, none of us pick our time in history but we are all placed in on this stage to play our part. And there are many, many people that are listening to me right now that say, how will I know when it's my turn to step when it's my turn to step on the stage? Uh, you will know. It'll be very obvious to you. And when you step on the stage, um, just keep in mind that you're not there alone. Are we going to sign off now and let me sing a song? Because uh, I think we've been on long enough, haven't we, George? Yeah, George just hung up. Okay, now I'm going to go. I'm going to go get a song. But, you know, let me just see if there's a certain person, and there is. I see that there's a person in the chat room, so I'm going to change. Instead of doing the song, he, I'm going to do a song from Bread. And while I'm getting the song, would any of you like to guess which song by Bread I'm going to put on? Uh, and don't try to answer right now because I'm not in the chat room. But I was going to put he, um, and I love that song, he. I, I especially like it by the Lennon sisters. Oh, I see YouTube is giving me fits here. Uh, B, uh, I'll give you, well, no, I was going to start to sing it, but then, of course, you would know what song it is. But I bet you somebody's already guessed it, <laughs> guessed it.
bread. Uh, sometimes, oh, the, one of their songs just came up. Okay. Here comes the song, I think. Oh, this is rather a steamy version. I think we all like steam. Let's have a look. I don't mean the group that did Na Na Goodbye. <laughs> Baby, I'm a want you. Baby, I'm baby, I'm a crazy. But I'm just kidding with you without you. Baby, I'm a want you. Baby, I'm a want you. But I'm just kidding with without you. Love and affection, giving me direction. 